good morning everyone thank you jonathan for reading the verses and for praying for me and thank you for all those who have uh, been keeping me in prayer your prayer is what keeps me going so let's start uh, with an illustration um in the democratic uh, republic of congo um, that's a country which is often ravaged by conflict and violence there was this young man jean pere uh, he was enlisted as a child soldier and he participated in barbaric acts um, his life was filled with violence and uh, despair anguish um, one day jean met a group of mission workers and they helped him to understand the love the forgiveness the grace that is offered by the lord jesus we see jean's life is transformed he starts on a journey of transformation he learns to forgive himself he learns to forgive those around him and uh, he learns to put on the new identity of christ jean's life is turned he becomes a community leader and uh, works to promote peace and reconciliation this is just one life we know many many lives who have been transformed and jean is just one example of them where the powerful example of putting on the new self transforms people by choosing to put on love forgiveness grace compassion jean was able to break free from the chains of his past and he becomes a beacon of hope in the troubled world that he is in so let's keep this illustration in the back of our minds as we go through the passage for today because we are going through a lot of good virtues and imperatives in this passage that will transform our lives as we went through uh, the uh, chapter 3 we saw that we have been raised with christ and since god has raised us with christ and we have we are as good as seated with him in the heavenly places paul is encouraging us to set our minds on things above we should seek things that are heavenly we should set our minds above we should set to put on that new identity of christ and now to put on christ first we need to remove all that is not of christ we need to remove out the old humanity and paul uses harsh language they put to death put to death which depicts you know the extent that we need to put off the evilness or the evil desires that we used to walk in and then in verse 10 paul gives a snapshot of what we are going to go through today paul says put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of the creator we are called to put on this new humanity why should we put on this new humanity it's given in that verse so that we are renewed in knowledge we are transformed more and more into his image the next question is how should i how should i right and that is what we are going to study for today paul is going to list down eight virtues in verses 12 to 14 he is going to give us eight virtues which can transform our lives and then in verses 15 to 17 paul is going to give us four imperatives or directives to help us in our lives let's read verse 12 therefore has god's chosen people holy and beloved clothe yourselves with compassion kindness humility gentleness patience okay before we go through all these virtues let us look first at how paul identifies the colossians and in fact let us look at how paul identifies each one of us he identifies each one of us has the first thing he identifies god's chosen people we are god's chosen people we are elected we are selected by god we are Uh, selected from the foundations of the world that is how god has chosen us he has chosen us and second he says that we are his holy ones we are consecrated we are set apart to live holy lives for god in christ we are positionally holy before god and third paul says that we are his beloved right we are his we are his dearly loved ones and see uh, ephesians 2:4 
but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. His great love that he had for us, in which he saved us. And we see here that we are God's selected ones. We are God's chosen ones. We are his holy ones. We are his beloved ones. And when we realize our identity, as God's people, as God's chosen people, the one who he has selected and kept us as his children, as the objects of his love, when we realize that, then only can we put in all these virtues that Paul is going to give us. Then only can we you know, put on, as, uh, as Paul states it, you know, clothe yourselves. So it's important to see how God sees us, what is our identity, who we are to God. So let's see the virtues that Paul says. Paul says, put on, clothe yourselves. So this is uh, you know, similar to wearing a cloak. And Paul is telling us to cover ourselves with all these virtues. And before we go into the first virtue, an important thing to note here is that each of these virtues that Paul is going to list down are the very depictions, are the very nature of Christ himself. And so when Paul is telling us to put on these virtues, what he's actually telling us is to become more and more into the image of God. And that is what Paul is trying uh, to you know, help us or motivate, motivate us to do. So first, we are, what we are going to see as we go through all these virtues, first we are going to see how the Lord perfectly put on these virtues and then we are going to see how that is set as an example for each one of us. The first virtue is compassion. In some versions, we see it as compassionate hearts. And the New Testament is filled with the compassion of the Lord Jesus. We can see, uh, I'm not going to read all the verses, but just the first verse, uh, Matthew 14, 14. When Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd. He had compassion on them and healed their sick. We see that Jesus not only had compassion for those who were sick and needy, we see he had compassion for the lost. He teaches them. He, uh, he feeds them. We see Jesus having compassion for those who are grieving, and we see Jesus grieving with them. Compassionate hearts, that's what we are called to put on. And compassionate heart is an inner reality and when it comes out, it comes out as an action of or a behavior of kindness. And that is what Paul is going to list down as our second virtue, kindness. What is kindness? Kindness is performing positive actions. And we see Jesus' life in the Gospels. It is filled with compassion. It is filled with acts of kindness. We see his act of kindness to the hungry, the, those who followed him day after day. And the Lord sees their their state of hunger, their physical needs, and he feeds them. We see the Lord's kindness towards the despised. We see Zacchaeus as an example. Zacchaeus was despised by the society because he was a tax collector. The Lord Jesus saw him. He went to him. He called him and he dined with him. And we see because of that act of kindness, we see that Zacchaeus' life is transformed. We see him repenting. We see the Lord's kindness to the children when, when the disciples tried to stop the children from coming. The Lord not only welcomed them, but we see the Lord blessing them. We see his kindness to the disciples in the way that, uh, in the way that he treats them, in, the, in his provisions for them, in his protection for them. The list could go on and on, but we see the Lord Jesus having compassionate heart and a kindness and that is a call to action for us paul is calling us he's calling us to put on compassionate and compassionate hearts and kindness in every facets of our lives so what are some ways in which we can show kindness and compassion we can show kindness and compassion for those who are struggling and those in pain you know, often we remember and we see things that are happening all across India and across the world. We see persecution in North India. We see Israel-Palestine war raging on. We see Russia-Ukraine wars going on. We see conflicts and civil wars all across the world. People going through pain daily in their lives. What are we doing about it? 
right? What are we doing? You know, the least that we can do is set aside time and pray for them. Are we, are we having that compassionate heart for those who are going through struggles and pain? The Lord Jesus had. We can show uh, compassion and, and kindness in our families and our church. We need to understand that no one is perfect. When we see our brothers or sisters going through struggles or difficult situations, what is the action that we are taking? Are we comforting them? Are we encouraging them? We can show com uh, compassion and kindness in our families. To the lost around us, our friends, our colleagues, do we see them in their despair and listen to them? Do we share the gospel with them? Do we pray for them? These are all ways that we can show. And for, for missions and ministries, we should be continually praying for the missions and ministries. You know, we have our corporate prayer meeting twice a month. You know, the least that we can do is hear out the missions and ministries, the struggles that they go through, and pray for them. And if we are led, we can also contribute, showing kindness. The next that we see, virtue, virtue three, that we see is humility. And we see the Lord Jesus' life was filled with humility. Right from his birth in a manger, the most humblest of circumstances, a king born in a manger, to his death on the cross, his sacrificial death on the cross, we see the Lord Jesus being king. He humbled himself. He set aside all his divine privilege. He humbled himself to the point of death. And his death on the cross was just to save us. What more can motivate us to be humble? The next virtue that we see is meekness. In some versions, we see it as gentleness. And while, while humility is more about an outer, uh, it's more about an ou outer sense, the um, meekness or gentleness is something which is internal, right? Which is taken outside of us. Humility is a self-perception, a correct self-perception of who we are in relation to God. But when it comes to meekness, it is how that correct self-perception comes out or manifests in our lives through actions, through interactions, through uh, others that we work with. And so here we are called to meekness and gentleness. And we are going to see one verse, Matthew 21, 5, which talks about the meekness or gentleness of the Lord. Verse Matthew 21, 5 says, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a, on a donkey. And we see this prophecy that is prophesied in the Old Testament is fulfilled by the Lord Jesus. And here is the king, the Messiah. He is coming into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. And that showcases his humble attitude, his meekness, his gentleness. We see another striking example of the humility and the meekness of the Lord in the Lord Jesus Washing the feet of his disciples. Again, just think about it. A king washing the feet of his disciples. Showing that true greatness actually comes from serving others. This is a call to action for us. How can we put meekness and humility as characteristics of our lives? You know, that's a question that we should ask ourselves. Just a couple of pointers there. By recognizing our dependence on God. We need to recognize that all that we are and all that we have is from God. And therefore, we need to seek our guidance in every decision that we take from God, recognizing our daily dependence on God. The next thing that we can do is recognizing pride in our lives and repenting for it. We see that often in the Bible, we see God, God's hatred towards the, the prideful, those who are proud in heart. We are called to repent of our pride, to, to, uh, to put away all those prideful thoughts and actions that are in our lives. The third way is serving others. You know, just as Jesus served, we are also called to seek out opportunities to sacrificially serve. We can do it within the church. We can do it outside of the church. Each task, great or small, you know, we should try to serve just as the Lord Jesus served. Moving to the next uh, virtue, which is patience. We see Jesus' patience with his disciples when they struggle to hear what he was talking about, when they struggle to understand his teachings, when they fought and disputed with one another, another as to who is the greatest. We see Jesus 
in his patience. We see his patience with sinners. The, the prodigal son, the, the uh, parable of the prodigal son illustrate the Lord's great patience for those who are walking astray. He waits patiently for those who have gone astray. And we see the Lord's patience with, uh, in his trials and his sufferings. We are called to put on patience. Virtue 6, bearing with one another. What does this mean? Okay, forbearance is an important aspect that we need to look at. Forbear I'm just going to read this de de uh, definition. It's a very powerful definition. Forbearance means tolerating or enduring the faults or annoying behaviors of others without retaliation or without resentment, even when someone's actions might be frustrating or difficult to deal with. How did Jesus bear with us? He bore with us through his sufferings on the cross. He bore with us through his ultimate act of crucifixion. You know, 1 Peter 23 puts it very nicely. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Jesus' suffering without threat, without retaliation. And that's what we are called to do. We are, we are called to suffer, to forbear, you know, has, has some versions talk about it. And that is a call to action for each one of us. We should not retaliate. How does it come when it, uh, how, how do we, you know, behave when it comes to dealing patiently with our, our spouses, our siblings? How does it come when, you know, we are called to forbear with our church members? We are called to patience and forbearance specifically in our homes and with all those that we interact with. The next virtue that Paul gives is about forgiveness. Let's read verse 13. If one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other has the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. You know, this seventh virtue Paul gives as forgiveness. But, you know, interestingly, this virtue Paul elaborates. Paul elaborates this uh, virtue and that should make us think, why did Paul elaborate this virtue as against all the other virtues? Maybe because it is very important. We see the Lord's Prayer also speaking about forgiveness. Jesus says, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. It's past, it's done. We have forgiven our debtors. And this verse emphasizes the importance of seeking God's forgiveness in as much as we also in the same light should be forgiving of others. Since we have received such great forgiveness, we should be filled with gratitude. We should be eager to forgive those who have hurt us. And again, interesting to note here, of all the petitions that the Lord put in the Lord's Prayer, there is one of them that he goes back to re-emphasize, and that is about forgiveness. When Peter asks Jesus how much time he needed to forgive his brother, Jesus' response was not seven times as Peter had suggested, but seven times. 77 times, which is a symbolic number to point to limitless forgiveness, unlimited forgiveness. Jesus then goes on to give a parable and the nutshell on that parable is that we do not earn our forgiveness. Jesus has already earned our forgiveness for us, but our willingness to forgive is evidence that we know God's forgiveness. I'm going to repeat that. Our willingness to forgive is evidence that we know God's forgiveness. Only forgiven people can forgive. God has forgiven us so much that we should be ready to forgive the relatively, comparatively smaller offenses that people commit against us. In the second part of the verse, Paul is going to tell us why and how we should forgive. Paul says, has the Lord has forgiven? So you also must forgive, right? It's Simple, has the Lord forgiven? You must forgive. And Paul has already told us in Colossians 2, 13 to 14, how we should forgive. I'm just quickly reading the verse. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debts that stood against us with all its dis demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. In a nutshell, when we were unworthy, dead in our trespasses, 
God saved us. How much did he save us? You know, it's given there in the words. N not just some of our sins, not just some of our trespasses, but all, note the word, all our trespasses. Note, cancelling the whole record of our debts. It was total. How is the nature of that forgiveness? It is complete forgiveness. God forgives and forgets completely, wholly. It says, nailing it to the cross. He has nailed all our sins and he has forgotten them. And that is a call to action for us. We, we are called to reflect on God's abundant mercy and forgiveness to us and to imitate it. We are to imitate God's forgiveness. We should be so thankful that God does not put a limit to the number of times that he forgives us. Just as God has forgiven us countless times, the calling to each one of us is that we forget, forgive again and again. Countless forgiveness. You know, we need to also recognize that forgiveness is not so hard. It's not actually easy. It's very hard. Our pride, our ego, anger, they all come into the way. And we can see that in society. We can see that in broken relationships. We can see that in broken marriages. We can see that in conflicts within the society. We can, in, we can see that in broken, uh, divided churches. When, when people hurt us, you know, it's often okay. We are okay to forgive them once, but not more than that. We are called to forgive. Brothers and sisters, how are we doing when it comes to be forgiving of others? Forgiving our spouses, forgiving, forgiving our church members, forgiving those who we interact with. We are called to forgive again and again. The next virtue that Paul lists down is love. Verse 14, and above all this, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Love is this eight virtue that Paul says to put on. And Paul says to put on love over the, all these other virtues. Because he says that all this love is what binds all these virtues together. Paul is using an imagery of a belt, you know, which holds things together, right? He's, hold, he's using that imagery and he's saying, Put on love which binds all these virtues together and brings about a completeness in the maturity of a believer. When we put on love, all the other virtues are held together and we see that we are complete in our maturity. The prime example of love is the Lord Jesus. And I'm not going to elaborate on that. Every other Sunday or every Sunday in some way or other, we see or hear about the love of God. For God so loved the world and so on. God's great love compels us to love just as he loved us. Just as he loved us sacrificially, we are called to love others. Without genuine love, we will not be able to put on all these other virtues. And that is a call to action for each one of us. John 13, 34 says, Jesus says to us, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. This is an unconditional call to love. Why should we love? So that the world would see that we are his children. So that, the, that we would point the world to a loving God. 1 Corinthians 13 is a beautiful chapter that talks about love. He says that love endures all things. The Lord Jesus gave the greatest commandment as loving God and loving your neighbors as yourself. And in 1 Corinthians 13.13, 13, as Paul end, uh, ends this uh, discussion on love, Paul says, I'm just going to read 1 Corinthians 13.13. 13. Paul says, So now faith, hope, and love abide. Faith, love, hope abide. These three, but the greatest of this is love. What does that mean? Faith, hope, love are what should be characterizing each one of us. Faith, hope, love is the strong beliefs that we need to be holding on to. And out of that faith and hope, 
are those beliefs love is what is emitted out of faith and hope and that should be what should be propagating us forward brothers and sisters are we consistently showing love to others the question that we should ask ourselves are others see, seeing god's love in us is our love compelling others towards god you know before we move uh, to the next uh, section these are the eight virtues that uh, paul is giving so before we move uh, to the next se sessions you know as i was contemplating um, all these virtues you know i found myself so much lacking in it and the question that came to my mind was is it possible and i'm going to give you an illustration uh, that i uh, i read as part of that you know a theological uh, student was talking in a prison for teenagers he brought in a box a boxing glove has a visual aid and he kinds of dangles this uh, boxing glove and shows uh, everyone there how ineffective that that boxing glove was without a hand in it and then he puts in his hand into the glove he makes a fist and he makes a punch into the air showing the power that has come into that glove because of the hand in it and that's a beautiful an analogy to show the difference that it makes when jesus christ comes into our lives just like that glove without him just like that glove without a hand in it we will not be able to put on the virtues we will not be able to transform our lives but with god in our lives through his spirit we will be able to put on all these virtues we are not going to become perfect but we will grow day by day we will transform year by year and that will be seen in our lives let us go to the next section where paul gives us from verse 15 to 17 paul is going to give us four imperatives it these are four directives that are there for our lives and reading from verse 15 and let the peace of christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body so what is the first imperative the first imper imperative is let the peace of christ rule in your hearts now what does this actually or practically mean to us when we need to make decisions in our life the peace that god produces in our hearts sh should be the distinguishing mark the peace of god that he puts in our heart should act as an umpire when we go to make a decision and that peace should direct us to what makes peace between us and god and between us and one another jesus as he ends his farewell discourse jesus tells to his disciples in me you may have peace in the world you will have tribulations when we are in christ you know we will have peace you know the key word in that in that uh, uh, verse is in me the lord jesus is our peace for he himself is our peace how do i let that peace rule in my heart you know it's important to know that word word rule how do i let peace rule in my heart and for that you know one beautiful verse is 26 uh, isaiah 26 3 you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trust in you when our minds are stayed on the lord jesus when our minds are focused on the lord jesus then we can have peace it is that peace that rules our hearts it is that peace that has predominance in our hearts when we are focused when our minds are stayed on the lord jesus paul continues to which indeed you were called in one body one body speaks about unity and peace within the community of god within the church you know when decisions do not go our way when decisions are against us we are not called to run away we are called to work towards peace to work with our brothers and sisters in christ we should not be dismayed or annoyed but we should work towards peace that is what we are called towards the second imperative is be thankful you know god's god's peace in our hearts unity within the church naturally will result in a spirit of thankfulness 
But irrespective of our situation, irrespective of our circumstances, we are called to have peace. Peace is an attitude that we need to cultivate. But again, you know, we are sometimes so thankless. We are so sometimes so ungrateful. You know, what is a way that we can cultivate that attitude of thankfulness? And in line with Colossians, one way that we can be thankful is by constantly reminding ourselves of who we belong to, being reminded that we belong to the supreme God, being reminded that we belong to the all-sufficient God, the creator God, the sustainer God, and this all-sufficient God is able, is more than sufficient to take care of all our tiny problems. Who we belong to, we should remember that he works all things for good and we of all people should be thankful. And Paul is going to repeat this statement and so we will again come to that soon. Reading verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. The third imperative, let the word of Christ dwell in you. The word of Christ is a phrase that is used only here, but it does not include only the Lord Jesus' teaching in his ministry on earth. It includes his teaching in the whole of scripture. His word should dwell in us. His word should permeate us so that all the decisions, all the plans that we make should be in light of, the, of his word in our hearts. Now, how can, you know, the question that we can ask is, how can the word of God dwell in us richly? When we take time to read his word, when we take time to meditate on it, to study it, to memorize it, when we take time to walk in obedience to his word, then the word of Christ will dwell in us. You know, the Holy Spirit uses that word that God puts in our hearts to direct us daily in our lives and that is why it is very important that we have the word of Christ dwell in our in our lives and dwelling means not only reading and obe uh, and and uh, memorizing scripture but it means walking in obedience to his word paul then lists the results of what can happen when the word of Christ dwells in us richly. And Paul puts uh, two, uh, two uh, uh, statements there in the second part of the verse. One is teaching and admonishing one other, another in all wisdom. Teaching is the imparting of truth and admonishing is warning against error. We have already seen this in Colossians 1.28 where Paul says that teaching and admonishing are what helps the believer to mature in Christ. And the second thing that Paul says is we can sing and praise and worship God with singing and with singing and psalms and hymns and spiritual spiritual songs with thankfulness in our hearts. These are two things that Paul puts in has the benefits or the results of letting the word of God dwell in our hearts richly. The fourth imperative that Paul talks about is given in verse 17. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The fourth imperative is do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. And this covers everything that we do. It covers our words, our thoughts, our actions. The old covenant, in the old covenant, we, we know that for every situation there was a specific rule or command that God gave. But in the New Testament, it's unlike that. There is not a specific rule for every situation. What we are given in the New Testament are basic principles of Christian living. The basic principles of Christian living, which we can use in each and every situation that we arise. How is that? You know, the question that we have to ask ourselves when we are in a situation, we just ask ourselves this question. Can I do this in the name of the Lord Jesus? What would Jesus do in this situation? Can I expect God's blessings if I do this action or say these words? You know, this verse is an all-inclusive rule for us to help us judge whether our actions, our words are right or wrong. Answering these questions will help us it will direct us to see that everything that we do 
is to the glory of God in the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul again talks about thankfulness, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And that is a practical application because, because Paul repeats this in three consecutive uh, verses. Paul is repeating it and that repetition makes it important for us to know that this is a practical application for us. You know, by nature, you know, you come again to the point, we are talking so, you know, high, but by nature, we are so thankless, we are so ungrateful. When we have something, or no, rather, when we don't have something, we want it. When we have it, no, that's not enough, we want more. When we don't get the things the way we want it, and how we want it, we are not happy, we are annoyed, we are irritated. You know, God calls us to be thankful in all situations. And that's what First Thessalonians 5.18 encourages us to do. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. God's will for us is to be thankful in all situations. You know, it's the perpetual duty of those saved by grace and destined for, the, destined for heaven to give thanks. We are called to continually give thanks. Why should we continually give thanks? Because that is what we are going to be doing in heaven. We are going to be giving thanks and worshipping God. In conclusion, the virtues that Paul has called us to put out here were perfectly put on by the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus put it as an example for each one of us. And let's just take an example of the last 24 hours of the Lord Jesus. Forget it. Let's talk about the last few hours of the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus lay on the cross. Physically, he was beaten. He was scourged. Emotionally, he was drained. He was filled with blood and wounds covered his body. The feeling of abandonment was so great in him that he called out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In that moment, in those emotions, look at the gracious words that came out of the Lord Jesus' mouth. To his enemies who had put him on that cross, to the, those enemies, Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Jesus is praying to the Father for the enemies who had put him on that very cross, showing his love and forgiveness that emits out of him. Next, the creator God, the sustainer God, the creator of the very waters says, I thirst. It not only shows his humanity, but it also shows his humility. To the thief who lay dying next to him, Jesus says, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in heaven, in paradise. You know, this shows the love and forgiveness of our Lord Jesus Christ. He shows us hope to those who are lost. And this is a call for everyone here who are lost, who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. All that we have to do is put our trust on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have any, if you would like to know more, please do uh, come to any one of us after the service. To the thief who deserved death lying next to him, the Lord Jesus said, truly today you will be with me in paradise. Next to his mother, the Lord Jesus points to the disciples and says, woman, behold your son. Woman, behold your son. Showing the love, the compassion that the Lord Jesus had. His love emits out of a compassionate heart. These very virtues that the Lord Jesus displayed were put on to perfection. And the Lord Jesus longs, He desires for each one of us to put on these virtues. Yes, we will not be perfect. But He longs for us to desire these virtues to become more and more into His image as we grow through our lives. Let's pray. Our Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you so much, O Lord, that as we went to, through the passage today, O Lord, 
we realize, O oh Lord, that we are your chosen ones, Lord. We are beloved of yours. We are holy to you, O oh Lord. You have set us apart as the objects of your love, O oh Lord. And so, Lord, we can be motivated. We can be confident to put on all these virtues that you have given us to put on, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that as we read today, Lord, these are the very depictions of your nature, O oh Lord. You were compassion and kind and loving and meek and humble and, Lord, you had patience and forbearance, O oh Lord, forgiveness and love, Lord. O oh Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you showed all this as a perfect example for us to put on. Lord, we realize, O oh Lord, how tough it is in this world, in the situations that we are in, O oh Lord, to put on these virtues perfectly. But Lord, we thank you, Lord, that with your Holy Spirit within us, Lord, that you can help us to grow more and more into your image day by day, Lord, year by year, O oh Lord, being transformed into the very image of our loving Savior, Lord. We pray, Lord, that we would let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts, Lord, in every decision that we take, O oh Lord, that your peace will help us to determine what is that right direction that we need to take. Lord, we pray that also your word would dwell in our hearts richly, O oh Lord. It would we would take the time, the effort, O oh Lord, to study your word, to grow in your word, O oh Lord, and to know you more and more, O oh Lord, so that we can sing and praise and glorify you, Lord, for the God who you are, O oh Lord. We pray, Lord, that we would be thankful, Lord, Lord, you have called us to be thankful in all situations, O Lord. And we pray, Lord, as we know that this is your will for us, O Lord, that we will continually be thankful, O Lord. Forgive us, O Lord, our ungratefulness and our thanklessness, O Lord. And help us, O Lord, to become thankful. Lord, we pray also, Lord, uh, that as we end this uh, session, Lord, that you would help us to put on the new humanity, O oh Lord, with the help of your Holy Spirit within us, O oh Lord. Lead us, strengthen us, O oh Lord, to put these virtues to grow, and Lord, to be transformed more into your image. In Jesus' most precious and loving name we pray. Amen.